Welcome once again to Painting and Mayors Art, History and Technical Study. And as everyone in the room knows, but perhaps not the people who are going to be looking at this record, recording of this talks today, um, but it's going to be on YouTube, but I will say it again, that uh, Painting and Mayors uh, is a, an opportunity for graduate students enrolled in the master's course in the history of art or curating. And students in conservation who are working on a painting which becomes the focus of these pairs um, research activities and together they decide on the research activities. We've already had one introduction and each um, painting explores the contribution of, of technical study and of historical scholarship. And um, the program is now in its 12th year so it's really popular and it's always really fruitful and very exciting to see the research that's done by our historians together with our conservation students, some of whom have uh, a, a strong background in the history of art and others who have fine art backgrounds or backgrounds even in science. So it, it always is stimulating and interesting and the questions that they ask are very varied uh, in relation to the pictures that they are looking at and restoring in the conservation department. Um, once again I want to thank um, Acacia Finbo who's amazing in the research forum. She's an amazing organiser and has made it very easy for everyone and is, is very welcoming and supportive. Um, and Karen Sayre, who obviously um, works together with me, and her Pippa, uh, Pippa Bausch, who, who helps us source the paintings uh, and works really hard to find really great pictures, both for us in the conservation department and also for this painting pairs program. So six pairs of graduate students have been working together to undertake research that focuses on paintings in the conservation department, which are in different stages of treatment. And this is the second and final presentation in which the pairs will introduce themselves and discuss the results of their research. And at the end of each talk, there will be a couple of minutes for questions, which I hope you'll, you'll ask. And those questions will be fielded by the, the pairs themselves. And we're going to start the presentation um, with uh, Megan Buchanan-Smith and Nandipa Mabair's presentation. But sadly, Nandipa is not been going to be able to present today. So I uh, hope that you'll be really supportive of Megan, who's going to be presenting by herself the Salvador Mundi painting that you can see on the screen. So welcome, Megan. <laughs> Uh, thank you and good afternoon. So I will be presenting on the Courtauld Gallery's Sam Tolmundi. So to recap, the painting uh, is currently attributed to the circle of Marco Dodrono, who was himself a follower of Leonardo da Vinci, and it is dated to the early 16th century, likely between the years 1510 and 1525. It is an oil on panel painting and it depicts Jesus as the saviour of the world which is an established iconographical type depicting Christ with his right hand raised in blessing and his left hand holding an orb. So these are our initial research topics from the start of the project. Uh, the paintings, condition and conservation history I largely covered in the first presentation. So now I will mainly focus on the painting's provenance and attribution and then its relationship both stylistically and technically to other contemporary versions of the Salvatore Mundi and other paintings by Leonardo's followers more generally. Uh, so the painting was acquired by the Courtauld Gallery in 1967 as part of the Gambia Parry bequest. Uh, this is a collection of paintings, ivories, glass and other historical objects that was formed by the artist and art collector Thomas Gambia Parry throughout the mid-19th century. And before it came to the Courtauld, it was housed at the family home of Highland Court in Gloucestershire. Uh, looking at pictures of the interior taken in the mid-20th century, you can see uh, several paintings from the collection. Unfortunately, I have been unable to pick out the Salvatore Mundi among them. Um, it is quite possible that at this point, so probably 1940s or 50s, uh, the painting was not on display because it was already in quite a deteriorated state and thus not photographed. Um, this is supported by this black and white photo taken after its acquisition 
uh, where you can see areas of damage and retouchings done in a previous uh, conservation treatment that already appear very dark in areas such as Jesus' neck and the orb. A technical analysis that I've undertaken suggests that this restoration likely took place while it was in Gambia Parry's possession. Um, here are three macro XRF maps. Uh, XRF scanning plots the distribution of different elements across the composition, allowing us to then make inferences about the inorganic materials present. So on the left is the lead map. Um, showing, so the bright areas are where there is lead white or lead tin yellow pigments and I included this because it just shows the extent of the loss in those areas. But then in the middle is a barium map and on the right is chrome and the highlighted areas are related to retouching or overpaint. Um, this implies that chrome pigments and the extender barium sulfate were used for retouching and these were only introduced into the art market in the early 19th century. One source states that Gambia Parry bought the painting in 1842 in Bergamo while another states that it was 1851 in Verona but either way the presence of these materials suggests that the restoration took place while it was in his possession or only shortly prior. Uh, there are no records of the painting before uh, Gambia Parry, and the only evidence we have are these collection of wax seals on the back of the painting. On the left is an Italian customs label, and on the right is what appears to be a coat of arms. While the crest is no longer visible, I have been able to do kind of crude outline of the shield and it appears that the helmet on top is barred which in heraldry usually means nobility um, so it may have belonged to an Italian noble family at some point in the past. But what is perhaps uh, the most significant label is this one and even though um, the coat of arms is masked you can still make out the word Milano um, um, which may suggest that it is more likely that Gambia Parry bought the painting in Bergamo as both Milan and Bergamo are in the same Lombardy region of northern Italy. Um, but that's, that is just speculation. Um, but this connection to Milan is significant as this is where Leonardo and many of his followers were operating in the late 15th and early 16th centuries. Leonardo was in Milan from 1482 to 99, and then again from 1507 to 1513. And this is where he completed some of his most famous works, including The Last Supper and The First Virgin of the Rocks, which is now on display at the Louvre. It was also the first sustained period um, in which he was responsible for running a studio, and his students or followers often called the Leonardeschi included the likes of Giovanni Antonio Ventrapio, Gian Pietrino, and of course Marco Di Giorno. Um, we know that Di Giorno was part of the studio by 1490 because of this extract from one of Leonardo's notebooks in which he describes another student stealing um, Marco's silver point, which is a drawing tool. Um, so he took it from his studio and when the said Marco had searched for it a long while, he found it hidden in the said Giacomo's box. Um, so Marco worked with Leonardo and other students um, of Leonardo and also took on his own private commissions. Um, and he very much adopted Leonardo's style. And it is important to note at this point that there was a culture of copying. So because um, of Leonardo's fame and the scarcity of his works, there was a high demand for his paintings and works based on his compositions, which resulted in a, a proliferation of copies and replicas. I'll come on to this in a bit more detail later on, 
that it is important to recognize um, that the Leonardeschi copied Leonardo and then they themselves were copied. Um, so this painting is um, actually to, to, to Drono's circle. We don't know who might have been his followers, um, but we do know that in 1487 he did hire an apprentice uh, to teach in the art of miniature, which suggests he was familiar with taking on students. Um, but what technical analysis can tell us is that the materials and techniques are consistent with works produced by Leonardo's followers. Um, so the painting is on poplar, which is the traditional wood used by Italian artists. Um, Leonardo and his Milanese followers did tend towards walnut as a support, but there are notable instances of using poplar. Um, the Virgin of the Rocks in the National Gallery being one, and then also um, this painting, um, An Angel in Red, which um, was made alongside the Virgin Rocks for the same altarpiece, and both are on poplar. And as you can see from the detail on the right, it has similar tool marks to the back of uh, the Salvador Mundi. Um, it was prepared with a gesso or gypsum ground layer, which is calcium sulfate, and which seems to have been applied in two layers. Um, and it has uh, turned quite yellow with time due to the acidity of the wood. Um, strontium is a trace element in gesso. I've included the strontium map because it shows the ground where uh, strontium has not been uh, covered by heavier elements and you can see the kind of diagonal brushwork of this ground layer. Uh, and there's also this dark brown thin layer above the gesso, which a staining test proved to be protonaceous. And this is found in other works um, by Leonardo's followers, um, such as Dorgiano's The Virgin and Child in the National Gallery, and I've pointed out this layer with the arrow. And it is thought that this may have acted as a sealing layer to reduce the absorbance of the oil binder into the ground. Um, this is fairly common. However, in the 16th century, the range of grounds used did increase. Um, and a lot of artists were using oil and colored grounds by this time. Um, and so another painting attributed to Dolcino has a white oil um, ground layer seen in the top cross section. Um, so the type of ground used is not necessarily indicative of a particular artist or school. Um, but the pigments I have found are characteristic um, of the time and of Leonardo's school. Uh, as you uh, copper-based blue pigment is found in the blue mantle. Um, a microscope detail you can see in the top right and a copper green pigment was also used in the green pattern band um, in Jesus's robes and you can see from the cross section that this has started to degrade turning um, brown and this is quite characteristic of uh, copper based pigments and then that uh, design was painted over the red robe and this again has characteristic pigments like carbon black, vermilion, and red earth pigments. And then the embroidery was uh, made of lead to yellow and lead white. Um, but the use of yellow pigments is a bit more unusual. Um, so on the right is the tin map, so it indicates where lead to yellow has been used in the highlights of the hair and this band. And that was more common for. Leonardo and his followers. But then we also found arsenic in the yellow um, of Jesus' mantle, and this would indicate the use of orpiment. Um, orpiment, which was um, imported from the east, uh, was never highly popular due to its poor stability and toxicity, and it was more commonly used in Venetian paintings, um, such as those by Tintoretto because Venice um, was a port for trading uh, with the East. So that's quite an interesting characteristic. Um, but the flesh painting is a bit more uh, normal for 
these kind of paintings with um, it being quite a simple construction of lead white, vermilion and carbon black and a bit of red lake. And this is done in two layers, which is maybe more easily seen in the UV image on the right. And it seems that the top layer provided a kind of cooler tone. Um, but this is quite different to um, the flesh painting in um, this version, which has been attributed to Leonardo, where the uh, flesh painting has been constructed with multiple la thin layers of uh, flesh paint, which might um, be more what you would expect for um, Leonardo um, and his sfumato technique, which is when he tried to create a kind of smoky effect um, by blending together shades and colours. Um, and looking at two details um, from the Courtauld painting and the Leonardo. The Leonardo, that's before it's been retouched, so that's original paint. And it does appear that it has a more, more smoky appearance. But this is quite difficult to tell because in the Courtauld painting there is still a lot of retouching in that area. And then, um, yeah, so the masking of brushwork is very characteristic. And you can only really see the brushwork in the Courtauld painting in the hair, um, which is pictures on the left. And the drying um, faults um, in this painting are also very characteristic of the time. So you have quite prominent cracula and also islands of paint created in the red robe which suggests that maybe the artist was not completely familiar with um, using oil paints and um, as oil was still kind of quite new in Italy at this point, that would be quite normal. And so it's not just the mimicking of technique but also um, the mimicking of style um, and there are many instances of Leonardo's followers replicating a Leonardo or making their own interpretation um, of one of his compositions. So for example, here are two versions of Christ carrying his cross, which are thought to derive from this Leonardo sketch um, on the left. And as Maria Teresa Fiorio writes, um, faithful imitations or variants made, were made for a clientele that was entirely foreign to the concepts of plagiarism and exclusivity. Um, so yeah, they were just working to demand and not really thinking about the authentic hand of the artist. And the Salvatore Mundi is one of these repeated designs thought to be based on an original Leonardo. Um, and the existence of this original is indicated by um, these sketches which are in the Royal Collection, which look to be studies for the drapery. And then also this etching uh, made in 1650 which claims to be after a Leonardo original. And as you'll probably know, this um, painting sold in 2017 is thought to be that original by many. And for the purposes of this presentation, I would refer to it as a Leonardo. Um, so the IR image of uh, the Courtauld painting would suggest that it is a copy. Um, IR can detect underdrawing in carbon-based media and also can show changes made to a composition during execution. And in this case, the artist seems to have been very precise um, in the execution. There aren't really any changes made. Um, and the underdrawing is difficult to detect, but there may be some visible in the lighter areas of paint. Um, there is no indication of pouncing or other transfer technique if the artist was transferring from a cartoon. Um, but it does stand to reason um, that this painting was copied from a pre-made design. And as you all know, uh, there are multiple copies of the Salvatore Mundi uh, attributed to Dogeno and other followers um, of Leonardo. That this copy is of particular interest um, as there seem to be strong visual similarities with the Courtauld painting 
uh, particularly the, the pattern on the band is the same, um, the orb is very similar, um, but there are certain differences. Uh, for example, the position of the orb in the hand is not quite the same, um, and nor are the bands on the orb. Um, and I also tried overlaying both uh, blessing hands, and though they are similar, they are not quite in the same position, which may indicate that they didn't come from the same, were not transferred from the same cartoon, but they may still be by the same artist or circle of artists. Um, unfortunately, this painting, we currently don't know where it is, um, but if it ever comes to light, it would be interesting to do a comparative um, analysis of the two. Um, another interesting point of comparison is the pattern. Um, on Jesus's robe, and the Courtauld painting does differ quite markedly from this Leonardo, um, uh, which is much more geometric in shape. However, this was not the first iteration of the design, and as you can see in the bottom right, there was an original unfinished sketch of a different design, which has become more visible um, as the top layers have become more translucent with time. Um, and thus, this does appear to be more rounded and maybe a bit more similar to what we're seeing in the Courtauld painting. And interestingly, this was painted in lead tin yellow, like what the Courtauld painting is painted in. So that's quite interesting and maybe room for further investigation. Um, I also came across this painting, uh, The Teenage Saviour, which is um, housed in a museum in Madrid. And I first saw it in this 1998 publication in which it is attributed to Ambrogio de Prudice. Sorry for my... Uh, um, yeah. Um, and, <laughs> and also it had halo-like uh, flourishes um, in the, around his head, which are quite similar to uh, the Courtauld version. However, when I looked online, a recent photo, those embellishments aren't present and it's attributed to someone else. And so I contacted, contacted the curator um, and it turns out the embellishments were overpaint and were removed, which is what I suspected. But um, you still see that the pattern on the fringe of the robe is quite similar to the Courtauld painting. Um, and it's possible that both artists are working from the same design. And so I went back to Leonardo and looking closely at um, the lady with an ermine, I found again this very similar pattern, um, which is an interesting stylistic similarity that it does, these stylistic similarities make attribution very difficult. And um, the teenage savior being a prime example. Um, curator sent me a list of the different attributions the painting has had since 1902 and it is quite a long list and at points it's even been attributed to Dorjono. So um, yeah, attributions of paintings um, by Leonardo's followers uh, remains very challenging. So those are kind of that's where I got up to with the research, and I'm afraid I've probably raised more questions than I've answered. Uh, the provenance still remains partial. We do have a link to Milan, but nothing specific. Um, but the materials and techniques are consistent with the works produced by the Leonardeschi and what you would expect from a follower of Dojono. Um, but it remains one of many copies. Um, and it is difficult to attribute paintings that follow the same style if there is no signature or airtight provenance. Um, and in this case, it is not possible to be certain. And we can point to similarities that may suggest an attribution, um, but then is it appropriate to make an attribution on that basis? Um, so possibly a more vague attribution to a follower of Leonardo or circle of Dorgiono is more appropriate and maybe even more faithful to the intent of the artist because at that time authenticity was thought not the major consideration it was today 
Um, and these painters sought to replicate a style that was in demand. Um, and it may also allow for a greater appreciation of the artwork itself. Um, but I would like to continue the research and I'm hoping that um, some level of treatment will help to me to see the, more of the painting. Um, and also I'm in the process of contacting more curators and conservators to ask if they've done any more technical analysis on other works attributed to this artist or his circle. Um, thank you very much. Um, Hello. This Peter Pear's presentation will be on the pair of paintings St. Sebastian and St. Anthony Abbott. To remind you all, I'm Talia Rattenborough, the conservation student, and this is Jean Mikael Mogwe, an MA History of Art student. The overarching subject of our presentation will be the ways in which seeming discrepancies in the materials and techniques of a painting can be addressed through pairing with art historical findings. To recap our first presentation, the paintings were previously thought to be early 16th century Venetian. However, to us, some aspects of the painting technique, particularly the finesse with which the figures are rendered, seem more typical of a late 16th century Northern European style. So the main question we hope to answer at that point was whether these panels are in fact Northern European or Italian, as Spanish attribution was also being considered. We knew that the panels had been in the collection of Camp House since at least 1683. However, aside from this, little else was known about the paintings. We had identified a few techniques we wanted to use to investigate these many unknowns, the first being endochronology. This technique was carried out to thank, in thanks to expert Ian Tyres. It relies on the matching of the pattern of growth rings on a panel to that of other boards from the same region and time period. The only problem with this method is that when the later growth rings are removed from a plank of wood, you can only get an earliest possible date for the boards. Such was the case here, so we can only say confidently that St. Sebastian and St. Anthony Abbott date to some time after 1491. Additionally, both panels are made from the same tree, which is kind of a neat finding. What was more interesting was that the wood species was identified as Baltic oak, which was predominantly used in the Low Countries in England, though it has also been found in a small minority of panels from Spain, France, and Germany. This already calls into doubt the painting's current attribution as Venetian, as it would be essentially unheard of to find a painting made in Italy on Baltic oak. Additionally, due to military tensions between Poland and Sweden, Baltic oak drastically decreases in use following 1655, meaning that the panels probably date to some time before then. And so here's a map which approximates the areas in which Baltic oak could have been used. One thing we must acknowledge in an attempt to create maps like this is that the boundaries we see here are not really reflective of the geopolitical realities of the late 15th to early 17th centuries, where dominion over the land is constantly shifting between different ruling groups. This is especially true in France, Germany, and the Low Countries. Here you can see some changes in the occupation of these lands from the late 1400s to early 1700s. While it would be beyond the scope of this presentation to fully explore these regional shifts, it is really important to point out that the materials which are considered particular to, say, France may also have been available in Burgundian Germany. Investigating these regional differences further, I noticed that the priming layer of the paintings appeared to be thin and streaky. This can be most clearly seen in the infrared reflective graph of St. Anthony Abbott. Furthermore, in the X-ray image of the painting, we can see that the wood grain of the panel tilts slightly to the right, whereas in the infrared image, the lines tilt to the left. This confirmed to me that it was, in fact, a priming layer that I was seeing in the infrared image. This was an exciting find, as, like Baltic oak, this sort of streaky priming layer is considered most characteristic of Northern European paintings. Next, a sample was taken from the ground layer of St. Sebastian. This sample was analyzed with FTIR spectroscopy, a technique which identifies the substructures of organic molecules based on the wavelengths of light they are able to absorb. We were expecting to find chalk, but instead we found gypsum. This is an extremely unusual result. To find a panel painted on Baltic oak with a streaky priming layer, but made with gypsum as the ground layer, is quite strange. As characteristic as Baltic oak and chalk are of Northern Europe, gypsum is of Italy. Still, both chalk and gypsum were used in Spain and Portugal. 
cross-referencing material and usage seem to only lose being open as a possibility for the regional attribution of panels, and a tenuous one at that. Over 90% of the Baltic oak used in Europe is found outside of Spain, and only some parts of Spain use gypsum. Additionally, when artists travel between regions, they tended to use the wood which was local to that region. So it's unlikely that an artist, say, purchased these two oak panels in Northern Europe and then traveled south to Italy to use gypsum. This impelled us to look further into the possibility of gypsum being used in other places. And while it is true that chop was the material of choice, north of the Alps, a few paintings in southern Germany have been found in which more readily available local materials were used. These materials include dolomite and, in fact, gypsum. Where else was gypsum locally available? Well, outside of Italy, some of the main mines for gypsum were located in Germany, France, and Spain. This begs the question of whether gypsum could have been used in southern France as well as in southern Germany and Spain, especially considering the indistinct boundaries between these locales. So, tentatively, we have amended the gypsum map, and this broadens the regions of possibility for painting a bit further. Of course, this map is by no means definitive. And after investigating the regional character of these paintings, we wanted to narrow in further on the question of the panel state. The first observation made was that the wooden support and the preparatory layers are quite thin. Generally speaking, this is more typical of late 16th century practice, at least in Northern Europe. Secondly, a sample was taken from the upper left portion of the sky in St. Sebastian. It was analyzed through a technique called SEM-EDX, which uses an electron beam to determine the atomic elements present in specific locations in a sample. And, due to the presence of its characteristic elements, this allowed me to identify the angular blue particles you see above as smalt, a pigment made from ground glass. Interestingly, smalt is most common to the 17th century, though it has also been found in some mid to late 16th century paintings. This seems to suggest that the panels might date to the late 16th century. Nevertheless, we wanted to see if this made sense from an art historical perspective as well. So, if Baltic oak locates our two panels somewhere in northern Europe, uh, whilst the gypsum in the ground layer draws the panels south toward the Italian peninsula, uh, then the happy compromise would indeed be that the St. Sebastian and St. Anthony panels from Ham House were painted somewhere in southern Germany, in either Bavaria or Baden, or eastern France in the Provence or Burgundy regions. Uh, it is worth understanding the rich art historical links between Venice and Germany, Flanders, and the Netherlands to negotiate the original attribution to the Veneto region. Um, so, we can trace a preference in the Veneto from the later 15th century onwards for a St. Sebastian type that becomes more all'antica, uh, with a subtly elegant contrapposto stance adapted from the classical statue of the Apollo Lycaeus. Uh, this Lycaeus model quickly became the norm for Sebastian representations in the early 16th century across the Veneto. But this quietly standing, more demure Sebastian uh, quickly evolved into more elaborate poses later in the 16th century, with Sebastian's arm more extravagantly raised and a more expressive facial demeanor. That's not entirely to say either that this one arm up contrapposto stance did not cross the Alps into southern France and Germany. Uh, on the contrary, there are many examples of Saint Sebastian in a similar posture, but the crucial distinction to draw here is how north of the Alps there remained a lingering preference for that characteristically languid, elongated thinness typical of Gothic figure types. A prime example is Holbein's drawing for the silver Saint Sebastian reliquary made for the Cistercian monastery of Keisheim outside of Altburg at the turn of the 16th century. Note the similar pose to the Lycaeus, but the clearly Gothic languidness of the figure. And yet, Hans Holbein, a few years later, was also commissioned his St. Sebastian altarpiece, now in Munich. Uh, this is the closest match we could find in a painting or drawing to our hand house, St. Sebastian. Although the figures in background are characteristically Gothic, the St. Sebastian himself becomes very reminiscent of the Italianate Alantica Lycaeus model, with a recognizable contrapposto stance and a more fully modeled body. Now, I use Holbein as a jumping off point for exploring just how permeable the boundaries between Germany and Italy were across the Alps. It was not infrequent during the 16th century for Northern European artists from Flanders, the Netherlands, and Germany to come south of the Alps and work and train in Italy for a few years. These artists picked up the Alantica models from artistic centers like Rome and Venice and spread Italian mannerism across the Alps almost contemporaneously to its continued elaborations on the peninsula in the 16th century. So some examples include artists such as Michael Coxey, Martin van Hinskirk, and Lambert Sustris, all Netherlandish painters who spent the 1530s in Italy before returning north for long and prolific careers. Lambert Sustris and his son Friedrich Sustris worked for extended periods in Bavaria, 
We can see similar Alantica like chaos figures in each of these northern artists' works, but with a particularly later manner of style of depicting the figures that also matches uh, with the way our hand house Saint Sebastian was painted. As the 16th century uh, progresses, the modeling of individual figures becomes more and more cursory, with brushwork increasingly evident, uh, so that a few heavy strokes, expertly placed, thickly outline the shape of a muscular torso. But the Hans Bastion's physical pose itself, his quiet demeanor, has very little to do with the dramatics of the typical mid to late 16th century manner Sebastians. Instead, the Hans Sebastian faces us in a frontal position reminiscent of a more traditional iconography, where the saint stands isolated in a niche to confront the viewer. But what really gives it away is how Anthony is painted. Uh, in an upright and settled posture, the Anthony from Ham House looks back towards more medieval Anthony types, remarkably similar to other mid 15th century Anthonys like Jacopo Bellini's or Pisanello's figures. There are almost no more single-figure, full-body, upright Anthony's by the 16th century, with artists in both engravings and paintings opting for more dynamic, sitting postures or more expressive and contemplative facial confrontations. But just because it looks old, does not necessarily mean it is old. Uh, the example of François Bréal's Saint Sebastian and Saint Roch from Nice is a perfect example. Bréal came from a family of painters active in Liguria, and his practice strayed uh, today's French, Italian, Northwest coast. Although painting in the early to mid 16th century, Bras works clearly favor a late medieval style, with singular saints standing in their niches, often arranged in medieval style reticles. His Sebastian here stands with a similarly antique posture to ours, yet it's dated to 1530. Uh, Bras also particularly oh, Brea is also particularly unique in the 16th century for his portrayal of a front-facing Sebastian that looks straight at the viewer. That is a much older traditional iconographic type. His picture thus evidences a continued market. <laughs> a continued market in the 16th century for religious art that suddenly harks back to the traditional visual language of the 15th and 14th centuries. Perhaps more suited to that type of private, quiet contemplation and devotion that patrons may have been looking for. I imagine an original configuration for our saints that might have looked something like Bellini's Saint Sebastian Triptyque, which also features a front-facing Sebastian and a side-turned Anthony. Our two saints could very well have been used to fill a similar altarpiece construction. My partner Talia uh, will elaborate on this subsequently. So a final quick note uh, about the landscape in our two paintings. Although it is a noted aphorism that Northern pictures evidence more detailed attention and care to landscape, I think that in the case of our two saints, the cursoriness of the background is not enough to discount an attribution north of the Alps. Heemskirk has his two saints crowd out their vertical paddles, leaving little space for a landscape which also consists only of a few dashes of thin, quickly applied paint. The twin St. Catherine and Helena panels, attributed to a follower of Flans Flores, uh, another Netherlandish artist who trained in Italy, uh, have similarly hazy, lightly brushed backgrounds. You see, in the course of the 16th century, the difference between the two landscape schools, north and south of the Alps, are more homogenized. They certainly no longer present such a potent point of stylistic divergence in pictures where the landscape was never intended to be the focus anyways, notably these full-figure vertical St. Altapiece panels. Also, note how the unattributed St. Catherine and Helena panels conveniently record their date at 1571. The two nuns with their stiff and unmodeled hoods have no problem kneeling underneath the female saints with crowns and cloaks that evoke classical deities or allegorical virtues. We can see here how a Gothic and humanistic classicism existed perfectly side by side in the later 16th century. Um, and I could not finish uh, without daring to venture perhaps an attribution. Uh, I, particu I particularly like Martin van Hinsker, who, uh, although on the one hand well known as a careful draftsman of Roman and Antigua figures, uh, like uh, uh, has also shown, like the Richard Virgin and Elizabeth panels in the previous slide, um, that he can paint more Gothic style saints in singular poses. His drawing of the old man riding an ass is similarly Gothic in its tenor, rather a cryptic allegory than a balanced and clear grouping of classical Italian figures. The heads of our Anthony Abbott and Kingskirk's old man are strikingly similar. Uh, if the drawing was made for a subsequent print, like so many of his other drawings are, uh, the design would have then been flipped and could very well have provided the model for our bearded monk. Another lead is to chase down Anthony's monastic dress. Different Anthony's don different clothing, often in concordance with the patron's preferences and wishes. Our Anthony seems to be wearing the brown scapular white habit dress of a Cistercian monk. Going back to the Holbein design St. Sebastian reliquary, that was made for a Cistercian abbey nearby to Augsburg, and it just so happens that Western Central Europe, around Bavaria and Burgundy, was in fact Cistercian heartland. Their founding abbey was in Cito, south of Dijon, Burgundy. Um, but it's important not to get carried away, and these are just some potential avenues of further research that could be interesting and fruitful to explore, perhaps finding a Cistercian patron in southern Germany, particularly hit by the plague in the later 16th century. Saint Sebastian, as Talia will soon elaborate, was frequently invoked as an expiatory plague saint. But ultimately, what we can here conclude is that the art historical evidence, rather than countermand the technical findings, actually supplements them quite nicely. We are leaning towards 
A. An attribution to southern Germany or southeastern France in the areas of Provence, Burgundy, and Bavaria around the later half of the 16th century for a patron who consciously requested an older, more traditional style. Now back to my partner, Talia. <laughs> Thank you, J.M. So the question really remains, what type of patron would consciously seek to commission something that evokes an earlier style? Well, we observed a couple of things, namely that the paintings, particularly in the background, appear to be painted in a remarkably expeditious manner. This can be seen in details from both paintings as well as in the infrared reflectographs. This is not something that is characteristic of any sort of regional practice. Furthermore, few possible traces of underdrawing are visible in the infrared images of either painting. In most cases, lines which look like possible underdrawings upon closer inspection actually correspond to thin lines of paint. This all suggests that the paintings were worked up as they were painted and that they were completed rather quickly in the workshop, perhaps for a patron of modest wealth. This begs the further question which my partner has alluded to, what could have been a small patron's interest in these two saints in particular? Well, in fact, both St. Sebastian and Anthony Abbott are plague saints. The panels therefore might have been included in a small diptych or altarpiece-like setup in order to protect the owner from an ongoing plague. This would have been following a strong tradition that arose as a coping mechanism to aftershocks of the Black Death that hit Europe during the 15th and 16th centuries. As notes art historian and conservator Melissa R. Katz, the periodic nature and regional character of these endemics created a psychological climate of expectation and dread associated with sudden, sudden illness. This prompted the adaptation of a series of civic measures, religious rituals, and cultural expressions designed in response to the outbreak of infectious disease. This may sound all too familiar to us here in the 21st century, given our experience with COVID and its many variants. In any case, what is crucial is that, perhaps just like today, people coped with the fear of recurring epidemics epidemics through all sorts of prophylactic measures. Katz goes on to explain that one of these measures involved the invocation of plague saints in painted forms. These saints typically included Saint Sebastian, Anthony Abbott, and Rook. Here are a few examples. This mid-16th century engraving by Jean Duvet, an artist native to Eastern France, depicts Anthony, Saint Sebastian, and Saint Rock, all in signs of good health. As noted by the curators at the Art Institute of Chicago, it is probable that Duvet made this engraving to give hope to those living in fear of the pandemic that was spreading across Burgundy and France during the same years that this work was created. Similarly, Durer put Sebastian and Anthony together in his Dresden altarpiece, a commission for Frederick III, the then Prince Elector of Saxony. Interestingly, the central panel was commissioned first, around 1496, and the wings were added around 1503. This is in fact the same year when a new plague had begun to afflict Germany. And what's more, around 1503, Frederick III also commissioned two more works that involved plague saints, one of which involved St. Sebastian with St. Rock. It is clear from, the, from this that these works were intended to serve a medicinally protective function. In light of these examples, it is not too hard to imagine the Hamout paintings serving a similar function, and indeed they do have a few features which are common to diptychs triptychs, and other such setups. This includes their arched top and their small size. Diptychs like the one you see on the right are thought to have been used in the home for private devotion. Additionally, the backs of the panels are gessoed and painted. The layers like these were sometimes added to standalone paintings just to protect the wood from warping. The backs of panels were nearly always painted if the object was intended to be seen from multiple angles. The objects which usually functioned this way, of course, were diptychs, triptychs, and altarpieces since the setup would be hung, moved around, or open and closed for prayer. Indeed, the technique of spotted paint that can be seen on the backs of the two panels actually resembles a common decorative pattern called marbling, which has been observed on the backs of many 15th and 16th century altarpieces, particularly those from the Netherlands. It was usually executed in red, brown, or green, and is thought to mimic the marbled paper that was being imported from the Far East. Furthermore, the presence of a rebate, or a cutout edge on the backs of the panels, does suggest somewhat that the panels could have originally been slotted into an engaged frame, a type of interlocking frame which is usual for a small altarpiece. A missing engaged frame can typically be observed by the presence of a blank edge to the wood and a barbed edge to the paint on both sides of the panel. An example of this can be seen on the right. However, in the case of such engaged frames, they are usually added to the panel before it is painted. This is not the case for St. Sebastian and St. Anthony Abbott where the barb of paint on the front of the pictures corresponds to the black outline 
on the edges of both panels. This outline is unoriginal to the painting, as it covers features of the paintings, excuse me, as it covers features of the composition that can be viewed in both X-ray and breaking light. Strangely, this would seem to suggest that the panels were added into an engaged frame sometime after they were initially painted. It could be a possible case of repurposing, somewhat similar to the aforementioned Jura triptych, in which the panels were perhaps added to a central panel, which they were originally not intended for. A tantalizing example of perhaps a similar case can be found in two early 16th century panels by central Italian painter Monado Troppi. These panels were originally intended to function as the wings of, the tri of a triptych, as evident in the mirror symmetry and the presence of the nail holes corresponding to a previous framing device. Furthermore, these were some of the few paintings that we were able to find with anything resembling a black border like that of the Hammer House panels. However, unlike in the Hammer House panels, the borders here do not seem to truncate the original composition, nor is there a clear barbed edge evident from the images we were able to obtain. These leaves us with some outstanding questions, which my partner will attempt to summarize. Thank you, Tyler. So, the territories of the Alps were indeed at the heart of religious tensions that erupted in the 16th century. Wealthy cities suffered waves of iconoclasm, like the Bielstrom, which hit the southern Netherlands in Flanders in 1568. When cities like Antwerp switched hands between Protestant and Catholic administrators, artists' works were often at the forefront of these political clashes. At the same time, southern Germany was also at the heart of repeated imperial diets between 1500 and 1579, and was a center for negotiating the upheavals brought by the Protestant Reformation, uh, which erupted in 1517. Cities like Augsburg and Munich became hubs of artistic patronage. This all speaks to a tense political and religious climate that would have been rife with cycles of potential repurposing for Catholic images, like with our two saints. The material traces, that strange black border that does not fit our current frame nor the outlines of the painted panel surface, certainly give evidence for at least three different cycles of framing. And, and how, how did they end up in England as well? Um, well, William Murray, custodian of Ham House in the 1630s and 40s, did in fact travel repeatedly to the Netherlands on business for the king. Could the panels have moved north from Germany by the early 17th century, at which point Murray brought them back with him? And is there perhaps a plague connection uh, to the saints in England as well? Um, the worst case of Black Death erupted uh, in, in, in between 1666 and 16, 1665, 1666, I think, at which point the paintings are recorded in Haven House in 1683. But it's important, again, not to get carried away by speculation and conjecture. Ultimately, I think what we can confidently say is that the panels were not painted in Venice and were likely painted in the later 16th century with a patron commissioning a more traditional early 16th century figure type by an artist from that school of northern European painters who traveled south of the Alps before returning north and working in southern Germany, Burgundy or Provence. I again particularly like a derivation from Martin van Hoenskerk's designs, perhaps transmitted through prints. The original play connection is certainly an impetus for commission and perhaps also the reason the panels stayed together for so long. Thank you for your time today, and we look forward to producing a detailed written report and continue our work with Ham House. Um, hello, um, my name is Sophia Bisbalis, and I am the conservation student. And my name is Abby Lee, and I am the art history student. And today we will discuss our findings on the painting tiled St. Jerome from a private collection. The image of St. Jerome in his study is tied to the workshop of Jos Van Cleve, whom our painting was attributed to by the auction house William Wallace, mostly through visual similarities to other versions attributed to Jos. Inspired by Durer, the image of St. Jerome in his study is characterized by a half-length format and melancholic pose of the elderly saint with a skull on his desk, combining the saint's patriological interpretation as scholar, penitent, and witness to the Last Judgment. These depictions were most popular, the most popular composition of Jerome produced by Yoss's workshop in his mature period, and there are estimated to be around 500 versions still around from the thousands of copies produced. So we posed the following research questions in our previous presentation. Uh, when was this painting made and for what purpose? Can the panel be dated within the lifetime of Van Cleef and his workshop? Was the painting made for a patron or mass market? How does the painting reflect the proliferation of depicting St. Jerome during the 16th and or 17th century? And how does this composition relate and differ from the versions attributed to Jus Van Cleef, his workshop, and other followers? And our findings will further inform the challenging conservation treatment which I'm currently undertaking. So 
Our first point of inquiry was the date of the panel due to the prolific uh, production of the image throughout the 16th and 17th century. Uh, the panel consists of two thin oak boards with a vertical grain, um, and the direction of the growth rings indicated that the left board was radial cut while the right board was acutely transverse. So dendrochronological examination was recently performed and identified that the two oak boards came from different trees in the eastern Baltic region with the latest heart ring of 1529. So Ian Tyres gave a terminus postquem or earliest possible date uh, for the panels uh, to be before to be after 1535 and before 1569. This is an estimation for the felling date as there's no sapwood present on either boards. Um, and the panel would likely have been used immediately after the seasoning period, which would approximate two to five years in the 16th century. Informed by the dendrochronology, we looked into the production of St. Um, Jerome by the workshop of Van Cleef. Whilst Van Cleef was mainly known for his portraits until 1525, when he pivoted to creating popular devotional images following the economic crisis in Antwerp. He offered paintings of three sizes to appeal to a large group of potential buyers with a variety of budgets, and also took on more journeymen to assist him rather than apprentices, specifically between 1523 and 1535. He also is estimated to have created the autograph versions around 1928 to 30 and using methods of transfer to expedite production processes. He doubled his production capacity to meet the increased demand in the 1530s. After his death, Cornelius took over his studio and continued to produce popular compositions like St. Jerome. He also scaling of his workshop coincided with the boom in the Antwerp luxury market in the 1540s and 1550s where the painting became a more important commodity. During this time, the Childer Pond or Painter's Pan was established, bringing an influx of foreign merchants into the city and providing an established platform for your wide sales. The pan attracted many tourists who went to purchase ready-made paintings instead of commissioning custom work. Because of the expansion of the market for devotional paintings in Antwerp, we decided to look into the possibility of the paintings perhaps created in the workshop under Cornelius. So as part of the treatment and technical analysis that was carried out, um, it was necessary to do this in order to understand the condition of the painting, as well as identify the materials and techniques um, that are found. So the two boards have a slightly curved horizontal surface left by the teeth of a handsaw laboring its way through the wood. The dent in the lower right corner further indicates the use of an ax, possibly from the original splitting. In comparison, the reverse of the 17th century panel often have evenly spaced parallel marks created by a machine saw at a sawmill. Um, the introduction of sawmills made it faster and cheaper to, do, to produce uniform boards um, and would likely take over the use of hands on very quickly. Um, so the rough and uneven surface of St. Jerome is consistent with the tools used to manufacture boards in the 16th century. Um, this is further supported by the presence of beveling along the top right and left sides. Uh, the edges were beveled before the painting was painted to facilitate later framing. Um, by the second quarter of the 16th century, uh, panel supports were often beveled for a later insertion into a frame. However, the panel has been slightly reduced um, size as part of uh, the beveling has been trimmed along the bottom edge. So x-rays um, are useful in that they can produce extensive information about the construction of the panel painting, including the types of joinery. Uh, the x-radiograph seen on the screen shows that there are two vertical boards, which were lined by two wooden dowels. As panels became thinner, thinner towards the end of the 16th century, dowels were frequently used to stabilize and align during gluing. Um, it's important to note that the buttons are not original uh, to the construction of the panel, uh, to the panel, as they were added in a later conservation treatment um, for more security to the panel join and splits um, due to the movement of the left board, which is due to its transverse tie. Um, so a dark pigment uh, coating was applied to the verso after joining. Mm -hmm. 
um, handheld X-ray fluorescent spectroscopy is a non-invasive method for identifying the elemental composition of a six millimeter deep painted surface. So XRF could identify the inorganic pigments on the reverse of the panel as it is uh, nine meters thick. So XRF detected the peaks for lead, iron, and calcium, which suggests the likely presence of lead white, calcium carbonate, and iron earth pigment. Uh, these pigments are consistent with the practice of applying a chalk and a brown pigmented layer found in oil or animal glue. Um, coatings were frequently used um, and applied to reverse of panels to reduce any tendency for the wood to absorb and lose moisture and thus warp or crack. While the surface coating may have increased the stability of the panel, the cut of the left board led to the development of splits over time, and, and this is exactly due to its cut. So the construction and preparation of the panel is consistent with Netherlandish panels from the second half of the 16th century. So the front of the painting was coated with a single white ground layer, which is also consistent with Northern European paintings. Analysis using a scanning electron micro microscope with energy dispersion X-ray, commonly known as SEM-EDX, identify the presence of calcium with minor peaks of silicon and aluminum in the ground layer. Uh, these traces are not unusual in chalk as uh, they're often found um, and chalk often has some minor impurities to it. Um, in addition, the translucent nature of chalk fossils known as copulates um, are visible under UV. So the ground would have been prepared in a very thin layer um, in either bound in glue or oil and would have been scraped until smooth. So the underdrawing in this image is seen in the Osiris image, which shows evidence of a compositional sketch carried out in a liquid carbon-based medium. It appears that the initial placement of the lines were made with a fine brush, roughly indicating the shapes of the compositional forms. In a later stage, there were changes made to some of these contour lines, as the correct lines were often reinforced with a darker line. Um, the underdrawing seems to indicate that the composition was transferred freehand onto the panel. However, it is possible that the artist used a non-IR absorbing material uh, to simplify and speed up the production process, which would be expected for copies like this. Um, artists often use several techniques, including pouncing or prickling or tracing. Um, and the confidence of the mark making in the figure's face suggests that the transfer method was most likely used. Um, as you can see that the artist used a single line to indicate the shape of the nostril and the shadow on the tip of the nose. Um, in comparison, parts of the composition which are unoriginal to St. Jerome in this study appear to be modified and that the artist is working through trying to visualize the, like, the shapes. So you can see this mostly in uh, the windowsill where there's multiple lines that are made um, and the artist is slightly changing his mind about what, what he's wanting um, to depict and what kind of detail. So while infrared reflectography de detected some of the underdrawings, more has become visible in areas of paint loss during the ongoing treatment of the painting. The photomicrograph shows several lines drawn in a brownish material with small black particles in Jerome's robe. Executed with the brush, the curved lines are tapered and economically indicate the roles of the drapery. Overall, the underdrawing lacks the detail of hatching or washes that are typically, typically found in paintings made specifically for a patron. Furthermore, the minimal drawing style suggests that the artist intended to develop the forms in a later stage as he was following a model. So, after creating the underdrawing, the artist applied a streaky intermediate layer, which was um, applied over the underdrawing, as you can see in the photomicrograph and also in the cross section. Um, as, soon as, as you can see, the flesh colored layer was transparent enough to allow the underdrawing to remain visible, but was susceptible to smudging. Um, and in the cross section, the underdrawing consists of small black particles, which is evident um, and confirmed by the Osiris image. 
Um, an elemental analysis of the intermediate layer has revealed the presence of chalk, lead white, bone black, and iron earth pigments. This layer appears to be consistent with Carl Van Mander's description of a primusal, a translucent flesh-colored wash um, bound in oil. Um, interestingly, the use of tinted intermediate layers would be superseded by the introduction of colored grounds in the Netherlands around 1575. And although this change occurred over time, it does support the conclusion that the painting was likely made before the last quarter of the 16th century. So the, in summary, with the painting technique, um, the, the artist applied oil-bound paint in one or two layers. It was very efficient and economical. Um, and the paint layers generally follow the carbon-based underdrawing, um, with a few exceptions, um, as in the windowsill and in part of his right and Drome's right hand and the edge of his hat. Um, and without going too far into detail about the artist's pigments, the palette is consistent with pigments available during the 16th century. Um, elemental analysis has identified vermilion, matter like lead tin yellow, iron earth, carbon black, and copper containing pigments. Um, I will now briefly discuss three areas um, in the composition which have changed due to degradation and previous restoration campaigns. Um, as these questions of these areas ask the question of how closely did the artist follow the composition of St. Jerome in the study made by Van Cleve. Um, and so these areas are the background, the table, and Jerome's beard. So the artist painted the background wall prior to executing the central figure and other features in the, in the composition. However, the wall has been entirely retouched during a previous conservation treatment. And as seen in this cleaning test, there is a bluish gray paint layer covered by a degraded brown varnish and a black retouching. Elemental analysis confirmed that the wall was painted with a modulating gray layer, which contains a mixture of lead white, uh, bone black, and a copper containing pigment. The shape and color of the deep blue and greenish blue particles suggest uh, the presence of azurite. Um, azurite was a naturally occurring mineral pigment. <clears throat> which was commonly sourced from Hungary and other regions of Europe and would have been readily available in the Netherlands. Um, similarly, to, similar to the other visions of this composition, the background would have been a lighter bluish gray tone than what is now currently still the black. Um, and as part of the treatment, one of the goals is to recover that original paint, which has been so extensively retouched. Um, and the removal of the yellow natural varnish and extensive retouches has revealed the painting's original color palette and balance. However, an exception to this newly revealed highly keyed coloration of the composition is this brown discolored table. Um, the previous restorer had applied a streaky layer of Prussian blue and iron blue pigment used by artists in the, starting in the early 18th century. So this made the painting appear closer to other versions of the composition. However, it would be considered quite an extreme approach today. The photo micrograph shows that the table is comprised of an opaque blue layer with a reddish brown glaze on top. Um, the greenish blue layer is comprised of a mixture of lead white, iron earth, and copper containing pigments. The brown layer has no distinguishable pigment particles under the microscope. Um, SEM EDX analysis identified pigs for copper, lead, and calcium suggesting the presence of lead white and a copper-containing pigment like copper resonate. A 17th century recipe for preparing copper resonate describes heating verdigris and a yellow lake pigment with linseed oil, pine resin, and oil of turpentine. This is the most likely reason for calcium to be present as it forms the substrate of the yellow lake pigment used in copper resonate. Um, and so the semi-transparent brown layer was probably green, but the copper-containing green glaze has deteriorated in the manner which is most known for copper resonate. And so the overarching goal of the treatment is to recover the original surface in the hopes of presenting the painting closer to the artist's intention while being honest about the extent of damage and degradation. And so in practical terms, this means revealing the degraded pain. 
And this, this deterioration phenomenon, discoloration of copper resonant, can also be seen in other paintings by Van Cleef, like St. Jerome and his study uh, at the Princeton Art Museum and in the Holy Family at the National Gallery. <coughs> Finally, so the previous restorer took some artistic liberties in some of the damaged areas. And this is also most notably seen in the beard. Um, upon our initial examination, we were struck by the color of Jerome's beard, which gave the saint a quite young appearance than the other versions of the composition. And so it continued to bother us with the question of how faithful <clears throat> was the artist to the original composition. The conservation, conservation treatment has revealed that the beard was um, heavily retouched. Um, and it's a heavily damaged area of the painting. So the brown appearance, which is currently seen in the image in the bottom right, is from a heavy, a very degraded yellow varnish, as well as very transparent retouching <clears throat> over abraded and damaged areas of paint. Um, And so as you can see from the cleaning test, the artist used lead white to apply brush strokes um, to indicate the strands of the beard. <clears throat> and so that it's the goal as part of this treatment to also bring back that the aged appearance, which would have been original um, in this case. So the materials and techniques of the painting suggest that it was likely made in the third quarter of the 16th century, which is in the lifetime of Cornelius Van Cleef. However, based on our findings and the technical evidence, the painting could have been made during his time in London. And so the majority, as the majority of Netherlandish and British panel paintings from 1450 and 1650 are made on Eastern Baltic oak, it doesn't help us to <clears throat> answer whether or not it could have been him while he was in London. Various pigments also were available in London as they were imported from Antwerp. And so Cornelius would have been able to use the same range of materials, whether he was in the Netherlands or in London. Um, due to the confounding of Cornelius and Yoss's identity, much of the authorship of the works attributed to Cornelius are not definitive. Works originally attributed to not named Soto Cleave and Soto Longa were identified by Max Freelander, and his upon chron chronological arrangements show a gradual distancing from his father's style. Freelander characterized Cornelius' style in the dark background and the deep set eyes, heavy shadow on the nose, and long handy fingers in his fingers. fingers. And these two paintings of the adoration of the Christ child done by Cornelius, the influence of the Italian high Renaissance style is visible, particularly in his use of light. Freelander also notes that in London, Cornelius seems to have primarily painted large devotional panels instead of the portraits he started from and his father was known for. So it is um, also unlikely that Cornelius would have continued to produce paintings meant for the market in the same capacity, as he seemed to have history painting aspirations while he was in England. Um, we also asked Dr. Peter Vandenberg for his expert opinion specifically about the workshop after the death of Yost and under Cornelius. He responded to our inquiry with this assessment. The St. Jerome is one of the few hundred in existence that goes back to one or three or four, um, one of the three or four autograph versions by Yost and is in all likelihood not even related to the Yost's workshop during or after his passing in 1540 or 1541. I see not the slightest connection to those pictures we know to believe might have been painted by Cornelius. Um, so due to Dr. Van Brain's assessment <clears throat> and the inconsistencies between the paintings and Cornelius' and style, it's unlikely to have been created in their workshop. Combined with the popularity of the image and proliferation of copies, dendrochronology, which dates our painting likely after the death of Yoss and concurrent to the rise of the Antwerp luxury market, we believe that this painting was likely made by a follower of Yost Van Cleef, specifically for the market due to its thrifty production value. It is our hope that further technical analysis is conducted on other versions of St. Jerome and his study in order to better understand the production of copies outside of the workshop. 
We would like to thank Dr. Eva Bernstock, Dr. Pippa Balk, um, and Dr. Karen Sayers, and Dr. Sylvia Amato, and the Research Forum for supporting and organizing this event. We'd further like to thank Ian Tyler's Dr. Peter Vandenberg, Dr. Maximilian Martin's Dr. Astrid Hart, Dr. Kate Smith, and Dr. Elizabeth Walmsley for their contributions. Um, we'd also like to be grateful, and we're grateful for Michael Carter um, for giving the opportunity to treat and research this painting. Thank you. Um, and I believe that we are missing a slide um, on Cornelius Van Cleef, so if you have specific questions about him, you can easily answer this now. Um, Yes, Claire. Um, I just wanted to ask a question about trying to attribute a painting um, which you know has got lots of restoration and um, and lots of damage and it's quite, and I, and I understand that you've consulted with experts about the attribution, but do you feel that it's like a really hard thing to do because this painting has changed quite a lot it, since you started looking at it during mm -hmm. the um, I just wondered if you wanted to comment on that as a, as a kind of uh, difficulty with the kind of art historically part. Um, yeah, I think a lot of what has come out of this research has been byproducts often of the treatment itself. Um, so when I first initially examined the painting, uh, the degraded varnish and the layers of retouching, which uh, most of the painting has retouching, um, made it very difficult to characterize uh, what was original and um, make sense of the painting. Uh, so by cleaning and slowly removing layers, but also taking cross sections and using technical imaging, um, the goal was to somehow piece together what was original. And um, it, it's a very difficult thing to say what the attribution of a painting, especially when it's so damaged, whether really it's by an artist, a specific artist's hand or not. Um, in this case, we are no closer to who that artist is, um, except with ruling out Cornelius and Eunice Van Cleef. Um, and so it, it's a painting that's also a byproduct of its history in many people's hands in this case. But um, with the goal of the conservation treatment, it's I aim to minimize my my presence in the painting and hopefully uh, make the original surface more present than it is today. So. Yes. Perhaps a question about um, the underdrawing, which it seemed like there was quite a lot of. You could see some pentimenti at the back mm -hmm. uh, for the restructuring of sort of the window and the and the architecture. So I was wondering if there were any signs of transfer or of any any. Yeah. All marks or anything? Or was the fact that it was so heavily restored meant that you couldn't actually tell the difference between? Well, so there's no, so far there's no evidence of any method of transfer visible. So usually with prick, pricking, you would see little dots and the artist connecting the dots to make lines. Uh, we don't have that. Um, and one of the issues also with what the, with the infrared with the photography image is that a lot of the retouching was done in carbon black mm. materials. So like the background, um, we cannot see any underdrawing in that back wall. Um, and that's just due to the, the dark black layer that was coating the entire thing. Um, so it's, and there's some underdrawing that I have been, ha that I have found um, visible while taking more images during the treatment. So while progressing through the treatment, um, more infrared photography images will be taken um, <coughs> to see more. Yeah. Any other? Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Emma, uh, and I'm studying for a master's in art history. And I'm Elizabeth, and I'm in the second year of the Conservation of Easel Paintings course. Today we will be presenting the work we've completed on our painting, Girl Reading the Task, which belongs to the Cooper and Newton Museum in Olney, Buckinghamshire. 
We're going to begin by giving you a quick recap of what we talked about in our last presentation, including the painting's initial condition and our research questions. Then Emma will talk you through our art historical findings, and I will present the results of our technical investigation and material analysis, and how they informed our further treatment and research. And finally, we would like to close our presentation by reflecting upon this appearance, experience, our collaboration and progress. The painting Girl Reading the Task came to the courtyard in the spring of 2022, where our treatment and research began shortly after. At this stage, the painting was a complete mystery to us. It is unsigned and undated, and neither the identity of the artist nor the sitter is known. Our initial research avenues were therefore to investigate the painting's provenance and physical history to see if we could uncover more about the girl reading the task. Upon its arrival to the studio, the painting was in an unfortunate and worrisome condition. It had several tears and holes in both fabric supports, the canvas was really slack and full of undulations, and the surface of the painting was covered by a facing, facing tissue which obscured the view. After the successful removal of the facing tissue, the heavily degraded yellow varnish and extensive campaigns of overpaint became apparent, as well as the severity of the structural damages. So before continuing with any further treatment, technical imaging was undertaken, revealing that there had been made multiple changes to the original composition. This included the surprising reveal of a child's figure in the x-ray, and the alteration of both facial features and the woman's hairstyle. It furthermore showed that the size of the book had been reworked, and the infrared reflector of image showed that the writing on the book identifying it as the task was in fact not original, but was applied on top of another version. Since it had become clear that the painting had been repeatedly altered throughout its life, our goal was to uncover more about the painting's history and attribution, and further examining its layer structure and material composition. To remind you about our painting, Girl Reading the Task shows a woman reading William Cooper's 5,000 line poem, The Task. It was donated to the museum in 1900 by Henry Willett, a wealthy brewer and collector living in Brighton. At the last presentation, we reported that we had found an exhibition catalogue at the V&A National Art Library detailing an exhibition of 60 oil paintings and watercolours from Henry Willett's collection, held in 1873 at the Brighton Picture Gallery. A painting with a description exactly matching our painting was exhibited under the title Portrait of Lady Austen. This is significant as Lady Austen was a friend of Cooper's and is widely recognised as the inspiration to the task. However, this finding threw up several questions. Was this the same painting as Girl Reading the Task? It certainly seemed highly unlikely that Willett would own two paintings of women reading the task. But if that was the case, why had the painting's name changed in the 27 years that had passed between the 1873 exhibition and Willett's donation to the museum in 1900? So we resolved to see if we could find out further details about the painting. What was the provenance both beyond 1873? Could we establish an artist? And who was the sitter? We proposed a twin, twin prong approach, reviewing the archives in East Sussex around Henry Willett, whilst also seeking clues through research in Buckinghamshire around the Cooper and Newton Museum's archives and the archives of its founder, Thomas Wright. We started by trying to follow the trail back from Henry Willett and the exhibition in 1873. His archives are held at the East Sussex Record Office of Brighton. Initial investigations of their online records looked encouraging. Willett's archives were extensive and we were hopeful that we would be able to find something about the painting. However, whilst there was a large catalogue of records, the vast majority, majority related to Willett's many properties, along with his famous pottery collection, which can still be viewed at Brighton Museum. We were able to find another reference to Portrait of Lady Austen. It was exhibited twice in 1873 in Brighton. As we had previously uncovered, it was shown at the picture gallery, located in the Royal Pavilion, and also the new Lion Picture Gallery from the 20th of January 1873 on Church Street. You can see the catalogue entry here. Unfortunately, we could find no further information into the painting or its provenance in Willett's archives. However, we were able to get a better picture of Henry Willett as a collector and supporter of Brighton Museums. He was a real fine art connoisseur, and his loans for the 1873 exhibitions along with 20 oils and watercolours, which he lent to a subsequent exhibition in 1874, show a man with impeccable taste. Gainsborough, Romney, Wright of Derby, Constable and Benjamin West were all generously displayed for the benefit of the public. Local newspaper, the Brighton Gazette, described the 1873 Picture Gallery exhibition as, quote, one of the finest to be found in the provinces, end quote. 
The walls were draped with crimson cloth, and the pictures, which were mainly on loan, were allegedly, quote, all of a high order of merit, being for the most part by English masters and selections from exhibitions of the Royal Academy, end quote. Having searched the digitised Royal Academy exhibition catalogues for both Portrait of Lady Austen and Girl Reading the Task, the only vaguely similar title which emerged was in the 1844 summer exhibition, A Portrait of Mrs Austen, by A. Morton, but this seems more likely to be Jane Austen or indeed another Mrs Austen. This begs an intriguing question. Willett was a collector of paintings by some of the finest artists of the 18th and 19th century, yet, with the best will in the world, girl reading the task would not be considered in the same ballpark as a Gainsborough or a Romney. Was Portrait of Lady Austen even the same painting as girl reading the task? Or did something happen to it from 1873 or 19 to 1900, or indeed after it joined the Cooper and Newton Museum's collection? And what had prompted him to donate the painting? We do know of some wider family financial troubles which led to Willett selling some of his choicest paintings in 1896 to Charles Sedamay in Paris. Could this have any link to the fate of our painting? Through our investigations, we have uncovered further stories of Willett's collecting. He once owned the Tudor Age Campion Cup, purchased for the nation in 1924 and now displayed at the Victoria and Albert Museum, which Willett bought from Colonel Campion for just £50 to finance the Colonel's purchase of, a, of communion plates for Poynings, Poynings Church in East Sussex. Also, the Dutch master expert, W.H. James Wheel, reported Willett's generosity, recounting the instructions he gave his manservant to offer one guinea to any students who visited Arnold House to view his art collection so that they wouldn't be out of pocket for their journey. I'd like to think that he would have approved of our scholarly endeavours as we've tried to piece together the clues. If only he'd been better at documenting his art purchases. <laughs> Having reached a dead end in our research around Henry Willett, we refocused our attention on the Cooper and Newton Museum's records held at the Buckinghamshire Council's archives in Aylesbury. Unfortunately, like Willett, this promised much, but ultimately led to little further information. Buckinghamshire archives hold significant records relating to the founder of the museum, Thomas Wright, but despite his passion for William Cooper, there was nothing on girl reading the task. What we have found is that the museum's opening in 1900 was a hugely grand and well-attended affair, where, quote, a number of well-known people went down from London in the morning, but they were hopelessly lost in the enormous mass of Buckinghamshire folks. The whole county for 20 miles round seemed to have assembled on the big local triangle, end quote. We also found that the museum's first honorary creator, curator was W.S. Wright, Thomas Wright's father, who held the office from 1900 until his death on March 13, 1915. Another discovery was this photograph of the Lady Austin room from the museum's 1918 guidebook, along with descriptions of some of the items held in the room, which included a pin cushion made by Lady Austin and covered with a piece of her wedding dress, and her bracelet clasp. Interestingly, it makes no reference to our portrait, suggesting that the museum did not link the portrait with Austin or did not deem it worthy of presentation. Before continuing further with the art historical research, I would like to present our current and ongoing conservation treatment of the painting and how our findings on the painting's material composition have impacted our progression. Interpreting the findings from inorganic elemental analysis using scanning electron microscopy, a reduced color palette for both the artist's paint as well as most layers of overpaint could be established. It consists of only a small range of pigments, including lead white, bone black, vermilion, differently colored eye containing pigments, and Prussian blue. All of the indicated materials, as well as the chalk and lead white containing double ground, are consistent with artist materials commonly used and broadly available in England during the 18th and 19th century. And while the identification of pigments, or rather their characteristic elements, can never be seen as a way to authenticate a painting, it can provide clues to its date or treatment history. It is important to note here, however, that simply because materials characteristic for the 18th and 19th century were used does not necessarily mean that all the restoration campaigns were also carried out during that time. However, since one of the main reasons for the development of new pigments was their increased stability, safety and longevity, it is rather unlikely that a professional restorer in the middle of the 20th century, say, would have used lead white instead of titanium white to retouch a painting. So overall, all current evidence points to a late 18th or early 19th century painting with overpaint campaigns that were carried out before the beginning of the 20th century. 
While removing the yellow varnish from the painting, it quickly became clear that the painting was covered by extensive amounts of non-original paint, and I will come back to the term original in a minute. By compiling and interpreting the findings of different analytical techniques, we could try and understand the painting's layer structure and material composition. Technical imaging, as well as visual assessment of the paint layers paired with their examination under a light microscope, showed that there were several different campaigns of reworking present, ranging from small, local retouching to large areas of overpaint, which covered entire sections of the painting, like in the background. And to come back to the question of originality, it has become clear to me throughout this treatment that it was really difficult to establish which layers of paint were applied by the artist and which are later additions made by someone else. On top of that, since the materials for all the different layers are mostly the same, it is really difficult to tell which areas were applied in what order. In order to avoid mistakes, I therefore do not want to speak of original versus non-original paint, but of the artist's composition and then subsequent campaigns of retouching or overpaint. So it became obvious then that for the treatment to proceed, we had to first figure out if something was in fact overpaint, if it could be removed and how, but also to make a decision on if we wanted to remove it. To see if an area was in overpaint and not original or artist supply paint, the examination of paint samples, which I had taken from different areas of the painting, was extremely helpful. After their selection, they were embedded in a transparent resin, which was then ground to present a cross section of the layer structure, like you can see here in these images. The samples were first examined by light microscopy, which was incredibly useful to characterize the exact location of the fluorescing varnish layers. So, for example, here in cross section F on the right, you can see that there is a varnish layer present in between paint layers, which points to the upper layers having been applied after the painting was varnished and thereby most likely not being part of the artist's own early composition. It got a bit more complicated when there weren't any varnish layers present in between the paint layers, as for example in cross-section K on the left. In this case, I had to carefully look under the microscope to identify what I was seeing and to try and establish if the uppermost layer was over paint or not. In summary, evidence from a variety of techniques of scientific examination was an aid in interpreting what I was seeing and making treatment decisions. Broadly, I was now able to divide the painting into six different areas which all had completely different layer structures and solubility behavior from each other. And unfortunately, even though I would, like to, I would have liked to present more findings today, my understanding of the painting's layer structure and the treatment is still ongoing, so I will present what I could uncover so far. After having established that certain areas were in fact overpaint, a decision had to be made about removing them or not. And it is important to emphasize here that I did not make the decision um, just by myself or according to my own personal aesthetic preferences, but I consulted all the technical evidence, my tutors, my peers, of course my painting Paris partner, and most importantly, the curator of the museum the painting belongs to. At the end, the two main reasons for the removal of the overpaint were A, that technical evidence made it clear that these paint layers were later additions and not part of the original or early composition, and B, that any subsequent structural work which the painting desperately needs to be displayable again would be inhibited if the overpaint couldn't be removed. So after having made these decisions, I successfully removed most of the natural resin varnish of the painting, including some of the areas of overpaint. The UV images here show the progression in the varnish removal, but as you can see, a lot of residues still remained. Since they are extremely hard to remove, I did some organic material analysis to establish their composition and make sure that what I was seeing was in fact old varnish and not um, some other material. The results confirmed the presence of a natural resin varnish, and I think that the tenacity of these residues might have resulted from the lining process where the painting was lined with its varnish and overpaint present, and therefore the materials had been ironed and almost fused to the paint layers. This hypothesis would also explain the wrinkling appearance of the paint in some areas. These images are also really hard to interpret, and unfortunately it is not as straightforward as saying that everything that is fluorescing are varnish residues. Some of it might be other fluorescing materials, such as resins mixed into paints, and the layer structure of non-fluorescing overpaint on top of fluorescing original material has to be taken into account also. Analysis of the binding medium will be helpful here to further distinguish what I can see. One of the biggest challenges and rewards in the cleaning progress so far was the removal of several layers of dark brown overpaint on top of the right background. After a lot of thinking and testing, I was successful in doing so, revealing a lovely dark blue shade underneath. 
So even though a lot of progress has already been made, a couple of areas still have to be addressed in the cleaning process, such as, for example, the retouching in the face of the sitter, which is nicely visible in the UV image, is dark orangey patches, but is better hidden under normal light. And even though there's still work that needs to be done, this on the right is what the painting looks like right now, and I think we can already see a great difference to how she looked like at the beginning. Now that the cleaning stage of the treatment is further approaching its completion, the next step will be structural work consisting of delining the original canvas from the secondary canvas, tear mending and the addition of canvas inserts, as well as the lining treatment. I will then be able to focus on filling and retouching and will hopefully soon be able to send the painting back to the Cooper New Museum, where it will finally be able to be displayed again. And even though I still have quite a long treatment journey ahead of me, it has been really rewarding to see the outcomes of everything that has been achieved so far. And I'm looking forward to the rest of the treatment. Returning, uh, returning to William Samuel Wright, Thomas Wright's father, leads to another interesting set of questions. W.S. Wright was born on the 8th of November 1831 and was first taught under the local Aldi schoolmaster, T.P. Lovell, before studying oil painting under Andrews of Colchester and then later at Somerset House. On Andrew's death, his wife wrote to W.S. Wright, he succeeds admirably in painting. T.P. Lovell stated, it is obvious that your desire is to pursue a higher style of history painting, while the course of present pursuit seems to lead chiefly to useful decorative art. On the left is a copy he made of a John Russell portrait of John Newton. We notice that there is a similarity in the neoclassical column to the right of Newton and the column to the left of our sitter. Could they be connected? Through Elizabeth's conservation work, we have found that the painting was retouched. Could W.S. Wright have been involved? Looking across all of W.S. Wright's portraits held at the Cooper and Newton Museum, we know that they are, are mostly copies of other works. On the right is a copy of the painting by John Theodore Hines Senior, Senior of Anne Don, William Coop's mother, with the original shown on the left. Is it possible that our painting has W.S. Wright overpainting? Or even is our painting a copy of a finer work exhibited by Henry Willis in 1873 and donated to the museum in 1900? Clearly, this is a pure, pure speculation, but we find it confusing that a connoisseur like Willett would have exhibited a painting which is not of the same quality as his gains with Romneys and West. Might it be a valuable exercise to compare pigments used in a known W.S. Wright painting with our work? We carried out some preliminary investigations into the dress to help us to date the picture. Several portraits by Romney resembled most closely the dress in our portraits and aligned with the late 18th century dating. We note especially the portraits of the Honourable Mrs. Beresford, painted in 1785, which has got the same kind of frill as on our dress, um, the same year as the task was painted. Linked to this conundrum is why the painting was seemingly exhibited as Portrait of Lady Austin in 1873, yet by 1900 was titled merely Girl Reading the Task. Had Willett found information in the intervening period to cause him to doubt the city's identity, or did this change occur when the Cooper New Museum took ownership, either accidentally or by design? As part of our work, we have sought to confirm whether the city, city was Lady Austin through comparison with other Austin portraits. In addition, we have also compared the portrait with known works of other women connected with Cooper. His companion of many years, Mary Unwin, his cousin, Lady Heskett, and a close neighbour, Lady Maria Throckmorton. Interestingly, there is some disagreement on the most well-known portrait of Lady Austen, with the most recent Romney catalogue resume casting doubt on whether this work is indeed Lady Austen, or in fact an image of Emma Hamilton, mistress of Horatio Nelson. It is certainly true that there seems to be little likeness between the Romney portrait and the Lady Austen miniature shown below it. Looking across the various portraits, there are some similarities with our painting, for example, Lady, Lady Throckmorton's headdress and positioning, but no one person appears to be a complete resemblance. Our sitter seems to remain an, 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 an enigma. <laughs> the art historical investigations into Gallery the Task have proved to be very challenging. The most significant finding has been to establish the painting called Portrait of Lady Austen, exactly matching the description of our painting, it was twice exhibited in Brighton in 1873 and was owned by Henry Willett, donator of Girl Reading the Task. It seems likely that the Portrait of Lady Austen is the same painting as ours, but it throws up the question of why Willett why it exhibited a work of different quality when compared to his games, Britain Romney's, or indeed whether something has happened to Girl Reading the Task since it was donated in 1900. Unfortunately, with no record of the painting post-1900, 
and no provenance before 1873, we cannot yet answer this question. We've also sought to confirm whether the sitter was Lady Austin. However, this has also been difficult, as the portrait by Romney and subsequent prints may be misattributed to her. We are left with the unsatisfying conclusion that our sitter does not exactly resemble known works of any of Cooper's female friends and family. Finally, we have suspicions that, given his role as honorary curator, along with his known artistic, artistic endeavours, W.S. Wright may have had some involvement in the overpaint we have found on the painting. On the conservation side of things, we have been able to establish that all materials used in grove reading the task are typical for British art of the 18th and 19th century. In this context specifically, a technical study or even visual examination of a W.S. Wright's paintings would be really interesting and will be one of my next endeavours. Treating this painting has been really complex so far, and we've learned a lot from it already. I'm sure that the next steps will not be completely straightforward either, and while it is of course challenging, I appreciate how much knowledge and experience I personally am taking away from this as a conservator. Part of this was also being faced with making difficult decisions and learning to trust my own instincts and experience, while of course never making decisions in a vacuum, but including colleagues, experts and stakeholders. Overall, the painting's stability and longevity were the priority from the beginning, and I've learned that, e that even though sometimes you really wish for better or faster results, it is never worth rushing the treatment and risking the painting's safety. All in all, this was a great learning experience and collaboration. Throughout this process, it became more and more obvious to us that most of our research questions would be left unanswered. And while this was and is frankly a bit disappointing, <laughs> we, took, um, we took this as an opportunity to reflect upon our experience and research and its limitations. And even though the results of our technical examination have not given us concrete answers, we ended up being able to give a tentative attempt at dating and attribution through the characterization of the painting's materials to the 18th to the late 18th century, a stylistic comparison of the dress of the city to other dresses depicted on paintings by Romney and Reynolds from that time, and the strong stylistic resemblances to paintings by W.S. <coughs> Wright, who lived from 1831 to 1915. So overall, we have advanced what people know about the painting, and we have come up with further research questions and avenues, which we ourselves weren't able to answer now, but might be answered in the future. Um, we'd like to thank uh, Kate Bostock of um, the Cooper and Newton Museum and also Aviva Bernstock, uh, Karen Sayre and Pippa Balch for giving us this opportunity which has been a really wonderful experience. Absolutely. Yeah. And also Claire Richardson and Pia Gotchada who support me every week in the studio while I'm <laughs> trying to figure out what's going on. So thank you very much. Good afternoon, my name is Alexandra Earl and I'm an easel painting conservation student. And I'm Cara Madarada, an MA History of Art student. Today we'll, we will be discussing The Bard Gate, an early 20th century unfinished oral painting by the British female artist Edna de Morgan. This painting belongs to the de Morgan Foundation and depicts a king clutching a purse of money, climbing the rocky steps to heaven and being halted by a barred gate. The moral meaning behind this artwork is to surrender the pursuit of wealth and fortune in order to obtain higher happiness. In our first presentation, we outline the context of this painting and the research questions that we hope to investigate by combining art historical study and technical analysis. We introduced key events from Evelyn's life and discussed what we knew so far about the painting's con condition and physical history. In this presentation, we will return to our research questions. We will primarily discuss the various research trips we've taken over the past few months and the ways in which these trips have aided us in attempting to answer our questions. I will discuss motifs we've been examining and hypotheses we've made regarding the painting's making and meaning. I will discuss the technical examination that has been undertaken so far and what this has revealed about Evelyn's materials and techniques. As we mentioned in our first presentation, this is, to our knowledge, the first painting by Evelyn de Morgan that has ever been examined using in-depth technical analysis. Upon returning to our research questions, we aim to investigate the following. Was the Bard Gate actually painted within the years 1914 to 1919? What evidence is there to suggest that it is an unfinished painting? Is the figure based on a life model or is it fictional? Is the painting intended as a diptych with the undiscovered country? What materials have been employed? What does the painting reveal about Evelyn de Morgan's technique? 
And this question in particular was answered not only by further technical analysis, but by visiting collections to see more of Edmund's paintings firsthand. This included the Watts Gallery, uh, Whittock Manor, and Leighton House. Another research question we had is whether there are existing preliminary sketches for this particular composition. To help answer this question, we visited the De Morgan Archives in London, where a large collection of both William and Evelyn's works on paper are stored. To ground our research, we paid particular attention to the motifs in the barred gate. For example, the crown, hands, and coin purse. Out of the sketches we inquired at the archives, these three stood out to us. However, there are striking differences between these and the barred gate. Even in these studies, which were drawn in chalk and pastel, you can see that Evelyn paid close attention to small details such as highlights on the knuckles, variations in skin tone, and shadows. These studies are works of art in their own right. We know from first-hand observation that this level of detail is lacking in the barred gate. This supports our hypothesis that the barred gate is unfinished. The study for the worship of Mammon in the center, um, in particular, is a testament to how Evelyn carefully considered the elements of each composition. We can see how Evelyn has thought about the position of the arm, legs, and highlights prior to beginning the painting process. All of these studies combined lead us to believe that it is plausible that preliminary sketches for the barred gate may exist. Another motif we focused on was draped and crouching figures, of which there were many. As can be seen in these examples, Evelyn would often draw the new model and the same model clothed side by side. This is influenced by her studies at the Slade School of Art, where Evelyn allegedly took classes each day in drawing from the draped and nude model for four hours, and from the antique model for a further three. While it was revolutionary that female students were allowed to study from life alongside their male colleagues, it was taboo at the time and women were banned from drawing nude male models and studying after 5 p.m. This level of preparation for her paintings allowed Evelyn to achieve a high level of realism in terms of the anatomy of the human form, despite that her painted figures are often situated in unrealistic and imagined settings. We noticed that most of these studies were intended for paintings, and unfortunately we weren't able to find a sketch that resembled the gentleman or the exact motives in Bardgate. Another possibility is that Evelyn used a female model. In some cases, such as Earthbound, we see that she either used a female reference for a male figure or revisited sketches for the pose in Earthbound. We believe that this shows that pose and drapery were more important to her than gender. The reason she might have done this could also be due to restrictions on life drawing of the slave. Throughout looking at her body of work, it is obvious that Evelyn hardly ever painted men. We are not sure if this was out of preference or out of lack of access as a female artist in 19th century Victorian England. Elise Lawton Smith also notes that Evelyn may have deliberately used men in her paintings as a symbol for certain qualities such as greed and despotic power. This is evidenced by paintings such as Earthbound and A Soul in Hell. With this in mind, we can understand Evelyn's depictions of men while sparing to be quite intentional and perhaps representative of her attitude towards society, society at certain points in her life. In the cases where she did use a male model, Evelyn consistently drew Alessandro de Marco. On the right, we see a sketch she made for the painting Boreas and Arithia, in which Alessandro was used as the reference. According to Sarah Hardy, de Marco had likely passed away by the time the barn gate was created. There are also striking differences regarding Alessandro's strong facial features and those of the figure in the barn gate. There are visual similarities, however, between the male figure in the Red Cross and the barn gate. For instance, the facial hair, nose, eyes, and tilted head. This leads us to believe that the same model was perhaps used for both paintings, although we unfortunately do not know the identity of this model as of yet. In addition to figural and compositional studies, Evelyn also made studies of heads on paper in canvas. Here we see two examples, one in chalk and pastel, and one in oil on canvas with red chalk under drawing. Some of her sketches, such as this one in the middle, there are some similarities to the figure in the barn gate in terms of the position of the eyes, the downward gaze, and turning of the head. This potentially indicates that her process might have involved revisiting sketches for compositions, and that sketches may not have necessarily been made for a specific painting, but rather as just references. The study on the right is oil on canvas in preparation for Victoria Dolorosa. 
It is likely that Edwin created detailed oil studies in order to experiment not only with composition, but with colour and paint application. This study in particular indicates that Edwin would initially draw in red chalk, which is seen in the area behind the hair. She, is typ she typically used a commercially primed canvas and then would build up the layers of oil paint. After consulting at Evelyn's sketches on canvas and paper, we have a better insight into her working process and possibly the influence of Italian art on her practice, to which she admired and studied closely. On the back of Evelyn's canvases, Windsor and Newton stamps appear from the 1880s and more frequently in the first decades of the 20th century. The absence of Windsor and Newton customer records makes it challenging to build up an accurate picture of Evelyn's relationship with the color men beyond this. On the back of the barred gate, a Winton and Newton canvas stamp is present with Winton in quotations, which also appears on the bottom and right tacking margin. Winton was advertised as a new variety in the art journal in September 1899, um, as it was introduced to meet the requirements of those numerous artists who prefer a more pronounced grain in their canvas that is afforded by the ordinary single primed. The Winton canvas is firm in substance, of even texture, and has a grain about midway between the single primed and Roman varieties. While it is possible that Evelyn could have had Winton canvases in her studio at any point, this at least tells us that the Bard Gate could not have been painted prior to 1899. We also see multiple examples of Winton canvases being used by artists during the early 20th century, meaning that while they were still while they were first produced in 1899, they may have come into popularity later. In ultraviolet light, there is evidence of a thin, uneven varnish layer which fluoresces greenish blue. This fluorescence, along with the glossy but discoloured appearance of this coating in visible light, suggests that it is a natural resin varnish. Upon closer inspection, it appears that this resinous media has been selectively brushed on sections of the gate, drapery, and background perhaps suggesting that this was part of Evelyn's technique, rather than an intended final varnish layer. The combination of varnish and paint is not unusual for this period also, as 19th century artists would often apply a varnish as an interlayer before later paint to saturate the colours. Due to the uncertainty of the surface coating, further cleaning of the painting has not yet been undertaken, as additional technical analysis and a better understanding of the artist's practice is required. From our ongoing research and visits to other collections of Evelyn's paintings, it is evident that Evelyn's larger and most frequently exhibited paintings are varnished. It is possible that this was completed by an art dealer, as it is not known that Evelyn typically varnished her paintings herself. During our visit to Whittock, this painting in particular, uh, Boris and the Fallen Leaves, stood out to us. Um, from looking upwards at the painting, there are noticeable areas of gloss and patches of matteness the latter of which has been circled on the left. These areas of matteness correspond to pink matte clouds and resemble the uneven appearance that we are observing in the barred gate. So perhaps this shows that Ever Evelyn removed material to create this chalky appearance at a later stage in creating composition. During our visits, it is also important to mention that we noticed that every artwork was signed with either E.P. Evelyn Pickering or E.D.M. Evelyn de Morgan. This further supports our observation that the bar gate is likely unfinished, as you would perhaps expect to see a signature. During our visits to the Hamilton Carr Institute, we consulted the Robeson Archive to further identify the materials Evelyn was using at the time. Both Evelyn and William de Morgan had an account with the colourman Charles Robeson and Co. Evelyn's account does seem to disappear after marrying William in 1887. However, this is possibly not an indication of any pause in her artistic activity, as William's account contains materials that could be intended for Evelyn's painting practice, showing that they shared the account. Moreover, we consulted the archives at the British Library in which a letter from Evelyn de Morgan to May Morris in 1917 provides valuable insight into Evelyn's experimental method, which she calls the process. The letter reads, The colours were ground in glycerin and spirit, and the ground used to paint on was a porous gesso preparation on canvas. The glycerin, of course, never dried, and when the painting was finished, it was removed from the painting by means of a sucker, plastered on the back of the canvas. The sucker drew out the matrix, that is to say the glycerin, with which the picture had been painted, 
The surface of the picture was then flooded with oil, or oil and varnish, to replace the glycerin. Only a few pictures were successfully carried out that way. Although it is unclear whether the process was used for the making of the bar gate, the letter nevertheless shows her experimental working practice and that at one point Evelyn was definitely mixing the yam into her paints to create a certain aesthetic. In order to further investigate Evelyn's materials and techniques, a paint cross section was taken from the pink background. As observed in microscopy, the sample contains a double ground composed of chalk and lead white. There also appears to be an underdrawing and a lower pink, la pink paint layer containing vermilion particles, which are opaque and bright red in appearance. Subsequently, there is a thin pink fluorescing layer composed of lake pigments and two paint layers containing pigments such as carbon black as well as, yellow, as well as yellow and brown earth pigments. Zinc white was also identified using microscopy as the small particles fluoresce strongly in ultraviolet light. The cross section also, also shows a fluorescing layer on top of the paint layers, which is characteristic of the varnish. Further analysis using methods such as Raman spectroscopy and Fourier transform infrared reflectography may help in identifying the specific nature of this, of this layer. <clears throat> Additional analysis of the materials employed in the bar gate involved using SEM EDX. Scanning electron microscopy with energy dispersive X-ray analysis aids in determining the elemental composition of pink samples. In doing so, we are able to identify specific pigments in each layer. For example, the elemental maps on the screen highlight that mercury, which is on the top, was found in the lower paint layer. This corresponds to vermilion, which is, a significant, which is a synthetic pigment composed of mercury and sulfur. On the left, you can see that the element calcium was located in the double ground layer, which is typical of commercially primed campuses during this period. And then on the right, you can see that zinc was found in the upper paint layers, which corresponds to zinc white. This result was further supported by observations in microscopy, in which, as you saw before, zinc white typically fluoresces in ultraviolet light. As we discussed in our first presentation, there's a label on the verso of the Bard Gate written by Evelyn's sister, Wilhelmina Sterling. This label states that this was, open quote, the last picture painted by Evelyn de Morgan, open bracket, unfinished, close bracket. She was working on this five days before her death, end quote. It was important to ensure the safe removal of this label as it was incredibly vulnerable and fragile. The adhesive was failing, and a large section of the label had already previously been lost due to lack of support. In order to avoid losing any further sections and significant text, the label was removed using a controlled method of introducing moisture. This involved locally placing damp blotters over the label in between polyphene matting. After the adhesive had so slowly softened and solubilized, the label was gently lifted off the strainer and canvas using a spatula. From the images on the screen, you can not only see how fragile the label was and is, but the colour difference between the exposed and previously covered section of canvas due to the build-up of dirt. Since our last presentation, we've continued our research into the reliability of the label. In Sterling's account, she states that Evelyn painted from dawn to dusk in her studio just four days before her death of nephritis and heart failure on May 2nd, 1919. On the one hand, we understand that Evelyn continued to work towards the end of her life, planning exhibitions and completing her husband's last two novels. However, we would argue that it is extremely unlikely that she was painting days before her death, especially considering her condition and the fact that she suffered from several injuries in 1909, including a debilitating dislocation of her right shoulder. This shoulder injury also limited Evelyn's mobility, leading her to create smaller works, which fits with the scale of the bark gate. If anything, this is further evidence that the Bard Gate was painted post-1909. What's more, many scholars have admitted that Sterling as a resource was known for being biased, limited, and sometimes erroneous. Elise Lawton Smith has described how, quote, the phrase, according to Mrs. Sterling, has come to have a hollow ring to the current team of researchers, as their experience has repeatedly shown Mrs. Sterling to be a less than reliable witness, close quote. Thus, while we agree that this painting was likely made in the final years of Evelyn's life, we are wary of Sterling's dramatization. 
After our research so far, some of the questions we still have include the significance of the crown and whether any sketches exist. We're also interested in knowing whether the halo behind the figure's head could point to this being a religious figure, perhaps Christ. We see in, um, in evidence other depictions of Christ, such as in the Red Cross, that she paints a layered halo around the head, and it looks like she was in the beginning of the sta this stage um, when she was painting the Bath Gate. We were also informed um, that this work was caught in the fire of 1991, um, which was further indicated by the visible layer of soot that was since, um, has since been removed during surface clean. And we hope to return to the archives again to gain more information on this event and um, what other works may have been impacted by the fire or potentially lost. It has been proposed that the Bargate was made as a complement to the undiscovered country, which had been painted in 1894. This theory cannot be dismissed as the two works share visual similarities as well as both being symbolic paintings which engage with Christian ideas of mortality. However, we would argue that since this is a thematic pairing, it may not necessarily have been painted at the same time as its counterpart, as we know Evelyn was inclined to revisit themes. Elise Lawton Smith also proposes that De Morgan's painting may have been intended as a response to Watts, Watts's small allegory of the open door from 1892 which you see here. And both artists may have had in mind Tennyson's God and the Universe. We have not yet investigated this in depth, but it could be an interesting hypothesis, hypothesis to examine in further research. In terms of technical analysis, additional investigation into evidence materials and techniques will aid in further understanding evidence process for painting the bar gate in particular. In this case, we hope to identify the resinous surface coating, which will help the treatment of this painting progress. In doing this, cross-sections from paintings by Evans' contemporaries would also be consulted. For example, um, Tate's archive of pre-Raphaelite cross-sections, and those taken from the recent restoration of Dante Gabriel Rossetti's La Gala Data, in which the artist actually mixed um, layers, mixed varnish and oil um, in layers, and this consequently complicated the treatment of this painting at Guildhall Art Gallery. We would like to thank Aviva Bernstock, Karen Sayer, and the Research Forum for organizing painting pairs. We are incredibly thankful to Pippa Bouch and Sarah Hardy, as well as the trustees of the foundation, for, for providing us with the opportunity to research this painting and for sharing their expertise with us. We are also indebted to Kate Edmondson, Dr. Emma Merplang, and all of the staff and volunteers at the Watts Gallery and Whittick Manor for their generosity and time. Thank you for listening and we welcome any questions that you may have.